All right, uh, thank you. So, um, so um, uh, what I, the, the plan for today um, is going to be to discuss uh, ways in which we kind of measure the complexity of field arithmetic. Um, and I'm gonna try to highlight um, you know, what we don't know, which is an extraordinary amount. Um, and, uh, but I guess before I kind of get into, um, um, before I kind of get into to that part, I, I wanna just like kind of um, start with the kind of tail end of where we ended last time. Um, Cause I, I feel like I didn't, I didn't fully make the segue. I don't, I don't wanna like, I don't wanna like never get through these lectures, but I do wanna like, I, I do want to kind of like have some continuity and just go from that last bit of that last example um, to like kind of like make it seem like what we're doing today isn't totally random. Okay. So, so last time, um, like the last thing that we did was we were talking about um, degree three uh, hypersurface in four variables. And, you know, um, and unlike, you know, earlier today where we were considering um, kind of the enumerative geometry of like smooth uh, surfaces like this, um, because these kind of like vary in moduli in general and are kind of much more uh, kind of geometric in nature, we're kind of focusing on the more arithmetic aspect and we're gonna look at like this particular class of, of singular ones. So uh, if, you, uh, if you think about um, a hypersurface um, that's kind of like, I guess I drew it as a triangle, which is kind of strange, but like, um, but, oh wait, no, I, I'm con confusing myself, sorry. Let me, let me back up a little bit and say, uh, right, so the, so, uh, so the example that I wanna look at um, is going to kind of come of this form, like we're looking at, um, we have some field extension E over F, maybe it's, uh, so there's a degree three extension, um, and we're looking at the equation that the norm of some element is B. So if you think about like wh where this is kind of coming from, like what we're really doing is we're like imagining, so this norm form, if you look at it, the algebraic closure, it's like the simplest possible cubic kind of thing that you could look at. At the algebraic closure, it looks like, um, I guess I already used X, but it looks like X, Y, Z. It looks like just the, the polynomial X, Y, Z at the, at the algebraic closure. And so we're really looking at some, you know, hypersurface that looks like, you know, this. Maybe if you homogenized it, it would look like that, which is a pretty singular kind of cubic equation to look at. We're looking at some, this, so this thing over here is some kind of like arithmetically twisted form of this guy. Um, but it's still kind of, you know, natural from the point of view of like if you're, you know, flipping through your book of equations and you're looking for like the next thing to look at, you know, it's, it's right there, you know, page two or something, right? Okay. But okay, so now, um, so now we, when we ask this question, like, can we solve this equation? And what is like a, a reasonable way to kind of understand when, when we can and can't solve it? Um, what, we, what we find is this funny connection. So I, I mentioned last time, well, okay, this is like a really kind of singular thing. Uh, if, you stick it in P, if you stick it as a surface in P3, which we're doing here, but it actually has like a, a very nice way of sticking in G3, nine, which makes you think that maybe you shouldn't have been look, studying things just by equations, but maybe for other reasons in the beginning. So let me, I wanna talk about the G39 embedding and that'll kind of segue into what else we're talking about. All right, so here's what you do. Somebody gives you a degree three field extension. Um, for simplicity, let's suppose that E over F is cyclic um, with the you know, Galois group uh, generated by some sigma. And we're gonna construct this algebra. So, I mean, my apologies for the members of the Brouwer group who are in the audience. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, just bear with me for a moment. Uh, so, you, uh, so let's say E over F is cyclic. Let's even just say that E is F adjoined uh, cube root of A and that we have cube roots of unity. So it'd be nice 
Coomer extension. Um, then we write this algebra that I'm going to call a b rho. Here rho is a primitive um, cube root of unity. Um, and so this algebra is just generated by two elements, u and v, which satisfy um, u cubed is a, uh, v cubed is b, and u v is rho v a, uh, v u, excuse me. So this is a so-called uh, symbol algebra. Um, it, it turns out to be a uh, central simple algebra, which just means that the center is the ground field, and well, symbol means no two-sided ideals. Uh, and so, um, and what you what you actually find about this is that um, okay, so it's simple. It doesn't have any two-sided ideals, but it, it may well have one-sided ideals, um, and but these one-sided ideals only come in very restricted way. So in this particular algebra, um, it might have, it may or may not have um, three-dimensional right ideals. Oh yeah, I should have, I should have said that. Uh, this is a nine-dimensional algebra. The, the, just with the basis u to the i, v to the j, where i and j are between 0 and 2. Right, so, um, so it may or may not have three-dimensional right ideals, and this describes a certain kind of structural dichotomy here. You might have that A is division, or you might have that A is a 3 by 3 matrix algebra. And those are the only two possibilities. And the distinguishing feature that lets you tell that apart is whether or not it has one of these three-dimensional uh, three ideals. Okay, so what's the connection to solving this equation? Well, um, it turns out, if you, if you look at this algebra, then sitting inside of here, um, you have um, f of uh, u. So sitting inside of a, f, adjoin, f of u, the subfield generated by u, is itself really just a copy of, um, of E, right? It's just a cube root of A. Um, and I want to make this. OK, I give up. Um, OK, so I have this f of u inside. And then uh, also, you can, so I can, you can look at the following kind of affine linear um, several, so uh, let's see. Not that anybody's going to check it, but let me just see. Ah, yeah, I wanted this to be a minus sign. If you're, if you're, but if you're going to do, if you're going to do the problems later, then it's going to be important. Right. Okay, so you look at this guy f of u minus v. Now, okay, just like by this is, you know, really just bijectively f of u. Okay, but. Uh, and so it turns out that if you look at the variety of ideals, so this is sometimes called x of a, this is a variety whose points are these ideals, like a right ideal of a, dimension 3. Um, so this thing, you can think of this as certain three-dimensional subspaces of the nine-dimensional vector space, which is the algebra. We're really asking, does this have points or not, if we want to understand this dichotomy. And well, you can take an ideal, and you can intersect it with this subspace f of u minus v. There may or may not be. There may or may not be. But, but we can take these ideals <laughs> that you may or may not have. And, um, and, and map them to here. And, and what that gives you is a way of thinking about this variety, which may or may not have rational points, as at least mapping to, uh, by rationally, this just affine space. This is just like, you know, A3 or whatever it is, right? OK, uh, so this, so, but what we get is a map from X of A into f of u, and it takes ideals to certain elements inside of here, and those elements turn out to be exactly the ones whose norm is b, and this is a birational equivalence. 
So kind of the right way to understand this, this equation in some sense, if you want to think of it as some kind of like more intrinsically defined smooth variety of some sort, is it's actually a model, a little affine model of the variety of ideals in the algebra. OK. It's kind of cool, right? OK, thank you. <laughs> I'll take it, I'll take it. OK, so now, now let me get back to where we ended last lecture, which is at this point, we look back and we say, like, OK, did we really want to keep counting random equations and degrees? Oh, question, yeah. So we have a map. There's at least a rational map from GR39 to A3, where I think about this A3 as really the underlying affine space of E thought of as like just a vector space. Okay. Of course, that E, though, oh, right. So what's the map? The map is that if somebody gives you a subspace, then I think about this as sitting inside of a, ni a particular nine-dimensional vector space, A, and I intersect W with this particular, um, uh, you know, F of U, which is E, really, um, minus V, this particular three-dimensional subspace. And, you know, the, the thing is, like, typically you have... Um, uh, Oh, did I do this wrong? I, oh, I did this wrong. I did this wrong, didn't I? I, I the dimensions don't add up. The, no. Okay, 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 uh, uh, yeah. six. Okay, the, it's, uh, the same statement happens to still be true. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It, you have, if you have threes, then you have sixes. You have sixes, you have threes. If you have a right ideal, you have a left ideal. The left annihilator of a right ideal go, takes you from the three to the six and vice versa. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, but now, because six plus three is nine. Those are the equations for, yeah, you could think of it as the, well, either one, they're dual to each other, right? Yeah. So you're either parametrizing six dimensional left ideals or three dimensional right ideals or vice versa or whatever, you know. But the point is, like, because six plus three is nine, and because this space is not a linear, but an affine linear space, you're going to intersect in some interesting non-zero point. And, and, this, and if you restrict this map to those things which are ideals inside of here, it's a birational map. OK. I should really move on before another mistake is uncovered. OK, but uh, does that, uh, OK. All good, question? OK. OK, so, um, OK. So instead of focusing on equations, we want to actually focus on um, kind of equations that are motivated by algebraic structures. Um, and what, we, what we'll find is that for understanding um, both kind of interesting sources of equations and ways of studying such algebraic structures, Galois cohomology is like is the key ingredient for kind of uh, you know for studying things. So um, so let me um, say a few words about about Galois cohomology. So I defined it last time. It's just the derived functor of G invariant points. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, we, c so I'll, I'll, I'm going to make a, I'm going to do the same kind of like ridiculous exercise, which is like to count saying like, what is H1 like? What is H2 like? What is H3 like? 
Um, of course, when we get to H3, we'll already be almost done because we can't say very much. OK. But H1, um, so if you look at um, H1 with, let's say, Z mod L coefficients, these are just um, Z mod L um, cyclic extensions. This is just examples of Galois cohomology. If you do mu L, um, these are um, so-called Coomer extensions that I mentioned before, where you join an Lth root of something. So these are the examples I did before. If you look at H2, as um, I, I might have mentioned with, um, well, let's say, if you look at um, mu2 tensor 2 coefficients, this, um, as I mentioned before, coincides with Milner K-theory. Um, so this is now Milner K-theory uh, K2 um, mod L. This is really the um, Mercury curve Suslin theorem. Um, uh, kind of uh, on the road to block Cotto. Um, if you look at uh, mu L coefficients, though, this is the, um, the L torsion part of the Brouwer group. So the um, so it's, it's worth saying just a couple words about the, the Brouwer group, because we almost already have. Um, and it's going to be kind of the main source of examples uh, for the next maybe 20 minutes or so. OK, so the, um, so the, the Brouwer group, so by, by, everybody knows what the Brouwer group is? No, does, does anybody? There's no way to, to actually ask this question and have people actually volunteer. Like, nobody's going to really tell me if I ask if you know what the Brouwer group is. Will you? What's that? I don't know what it is. Oh, okay, awesome. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> let me tell you. Okay, so let me do, I'll, I'll just give a very brief summary. But uh, so, so if you're given, so of course, we're starting with some field F. And as I defined before, there's this notion of a central simple algebra over F. Let me just say that I've just defined it because it's an algebra that's central, which means the center is F. And it's simple, no two-sided ideals. So the definition is the name. <laughs> OK, so there's this thing called a central simple algebra. And the remarkable thing about them is that if you take two of them and you tensor them together, this is another one. They're the closed under tensor products. Um, there is a notion of Brouwer equivalence, where we say that two of them are equivalent if matrices of some size over one is matrices of some other size over the other. And under that operation, with this operation and this notion of equivalence, they form a group. So the equivalence class of A plus the equivalence class of B is the class of A tensor B. OK, so this is. Um, this is, the, this is the Brouwer group. Um, now, so you might ask, like, why central simple algebras? Why, do, why does one care? And of course, the answer is that everybody deeply cares about division algebras. Uh, that's not a joke. We all deeply care about division algebras. This is like the fundamental thing, one of the kind of basic building blocks of the universe, right? So yes, yes, right. So. Um, so the, the point here is that if you have a central simple algebra, you know, Wedderburn Arten says that it's uh, matrices with entries in a division algebra. And really, up to Brouwer equivalence, we're studying these division algebras. And so the kind of classes in the Brouwer group are division algebras, kind of uniquely determined up to isomorphism. And there's an operation on division algebras. The crazy thing is that, um, is that the second cohomology group describes these equivalence classes of, of Brouwer classes. And, and you can see a little bit of this, um, of this show up uh, in the following way. So like um, these symbol algebras, for example. So to write this symbol algebra down, by the way, I used the fact that I had roots of unity, because that was in the multiplication table. If you have roots of unity, then of course, you know, these, all these things actually like coincide. And what you find is that, well, over here, um, 
one example, you know, what do elements in here look like? They're Coomer extensions. So you could think of them as described by a particular element in the multiplicative group and the notion of taking its nth root or whatever is that Coomer extension or cyclic extension. And if you take a cup product, because this thing is a ring, you land inside of here, and this cup product is this algebra construction. So you know, so you can you can kind of have other ways of describing things when you don't have roots of unity, but just kind of in this particular case, this is kind of an illustration of how these uh, central simple algebras are like arising as uh, you know as being represented by things in H2. What's the, what's the connection with H2? In fact, though. Um, you know, this, so this, this kind of gets to the kind of first interesting, uh, interesting uh, point, which is that if you have roots of unity, uh, because of mercurius Suslin, you know by definition that Milner K theory is just GVH to AB. So Milner K theory is generated by these things. Um, but in general, in H2, you know, these are very special algebras. So kind of why should all these algebras be described by algebras of this sort? It's certainly not true that every algebra has to be isomorphic to one of these symbols, but this, this crazy Mercury of Suslin fact tells us if we have roots of unity so that these things coincide, then at least the Brouwer group is, the L torsion is generated by things like this. So these symbol algebras, so what that, what is that, you know, concretely what that says is that if somebody gives you an arbitrary uh, division algebra or central simple algebra, and you have the L roots of unity, then up to Brouwer equivalence, you can write it um, as a as a sum of of these symbol algebras. In other words, like it's it's um, well, I should say tensor product. It's equivalent to a tensor product of these symbol algebras. So this gets to the um, to the first kind of question, which is like, you know, like we were doing in the case of um, you know quadratic forms, in the case of cubic field extensions, a very natural question to ask is like, how hard is it to write down different kinds of algebraic objects? If somebody if somebody says, okay, I have a division algebra. And by the way, I should, I should mention, it's, uh, it's, it's good to mention that kind of from the Wedderburn Norton style thinking that the dimension of any central simple algebra turns out to be a square, just because they're basically matrix algebras when you go to the algebraic closure. And so you can take the square root of the dimension, that's called the degree. Um, if the degree of the underlying division algebra is defined to be the index of A. And so you think about the index of the algebra as like kind of the little kind of like fundamental n nugget size. It's not a, you know, the, it's the, you know, the non-trivial bit in the middle of the algebra. Okay. So anyways, somebody, let's say somebody gives you an algebra um, and they, and you, and the, the question is like, how, maybe if you have roots of unity or something like that, um, how easy is it to, to kind of come up with this kind of description? Like how close, are you a symbol or how close are you to a symbol? So again, let's just kind of count. Uh, degree two. <laughs> okay, somebody gives you an algebra of degree two, four dimensional algebra. These are so-called quaternion algebras. It's a very ancient, ancient fact. Um, that these are symbols. So these are always kind of given by this kind of construction, which is like a generalized quaternionic construction in that case, right? Uh, degree three. Well, now it's a much less trivial, but also very classical fact of Wedderburn that these, that these are symbols. So they're just a single symbol. Um, okay, now, um, once we start uh, getting to degree four, well, now things are a little uh, 
a little more sticky. So, uh, so now it, it turns out that in degree four, you have, a, so some, you have some random algebra of degree four. OK, the very classical fact, I guess, somewhat classical fact of Albert is that, oh, I'm sorry, there was another thing I forgot to mention about the Brouwer group, which is that it's a group, but it's also a torsion group. And so the elements in the Brouwer group um, have an order. You know, the, so the period of an algebra, or sometimes called the exponent of the algebra, is defined to be the order of the class of A in the Brouwer group. And the, um, the, the super useful fact is that um, the, the period of an algebra always divides the index. And the index divides some power of the period. Um, so in other words, they have the same prime factors. The period's always smaller. They have the same prime factors, um, but maybe just to different powers. So if somebody says, I have an algebra of degree 4, or maybe I should say index 4 even, then the period might be 4 or it might be 2. Kind of period 2 is kind of like a simpler algebra in some sense or a smaller algebra of some sense. So if the period is 2, well, then a very classical fact tells you that this algebra is actually a tensor product of two quaternion algebras. And so, you know, of course, then that means that you can write it as, you know, two symbols, basically. Um, if the algebra has period four, though, you might ask, well, maybe, maybe, it's, just a, maybe it's just a single symbol, right, that, if, if you're lucky. But um, there, so interestingly, there is an obstruction to it being a, sing, a single symbol, to A being just a single symbol. And that obstruction um, lands in H4. Which, you know, is all, which is interesting just because like, it's starting to tell you that even though, like, you know, we try to do as little as possible, right? And so we, we say, like, okay, well, maybe we care about division algebras. And, you know, so we, maybe we care about H2. So we have to start looking at H2 to understand division algebras. And you feel like I, I shouldn't have to go higher than that because it's all in H2. That's just the Brouwer group right there. But then, actually, when you're studying these division algebras, you realize that, you need to know about higher cohomology to actually understand them. So it's, it's unavoidable, right, is what I'm saying, unavoidable. It's very strange, but OK. So you, OK, um, degree 5, uh, there is a conjecture that such things are just a single symbol. So in fact, it's conjectured that for any prime number, it's just a single symbol. Maybe, I don't know if it's, uh, some people believe it. Um, but uh, I think the best I, the best I know how to say is um, kind of using the fact that you can find a, a like splitting field of degree six and using Rosset Tate. I think the best I know how to do, maybe somebody can do better, you can show that A is similar to a tensor product of um, six symbols. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Maybe that's really crappy. There's probably a better. Is there? Is that the best? So life is hard, right? <laughs> life is hard. We think it should be one, but we can write it as a sum of six. Um, so let's say, let me um, kind of skip degree six, that's not so interesting, but up to degree seven. Degree seven, again, like, I don't think there's, like, a good way to, um, you can kind of, like, reduce this kind of question structurally to prime powers, so six is not so interesting. But seven, maybe you're, like, a tensor product of, like, six factorial symbols. <laughs> but I don't think, like, I don't know how to do better than that. Maybe one can. Um, degree eight, um, but I'm not going to go much higher, 
I'm just, if you're, okay. Degree eight, um, we know that you, uh, if, you're, if you're period two, then, you know, so you might be a tensor product of a bunch of quaternions then, right? You know, in principle, you are. How many quaternions? Well, this is at least going to be something eight-dimensional, so you'll need at least three. Um, but it's an interesting fact that three doesn't have to be enough. Sometimes you need four. So this is a, a very kind of like um, uh, famous result of, uh, of Tignol and, and Rowan's uh, independently. Uh, let's see. Let me say, just as the last one, um, what about degree nine, um, period three? I'm avoiding, the, I'm not, this is not an exhaustive list. But so degree nine, period three, well, a priori, you know you need at least two, but, um, but uh, results of, um, for example, Karpenko at least, and maybe Kelly McKinney, and I'm not sure um, who else to attribute that to, shows that, that you can't do two. Two is, doesn't have to be enough. You'll need at least uh, three. But is three enough? And, and here's where life gets really horrible. Like, so, so we know, if somebody gives you an algebra of degree nine in period three, you know in the Brow group it's a tensor product of a bunch of symbols of degree three. How many do you need? We know that there's a bound. Just one can argue that there exists a bound. How big is it? The best I can do, I, I mean, I, it would be great if somebody can, uh, I would love to challenge somebody to beat me, but I mean, but I know this sucks, okay? Um, the best I know how to do, so if you contain an algebraically closed field, then at worst, uh, you need 3 to the 11 minus 1. That's the best bound I know right now. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, question. No, like, so generally speaking, if you know the answer, then you had a, uh, like a clever way of like actually like construct doing a construction, um, and then you know like and then um, these like these lower bounds are obtainable often by um, you know by kind of more abstract thought kind of without kind of doing something pretty you're kind of looking for kind of like invariance that kind of like say that you need to at least deal with invariance uh, of this sort somehow, you know, I don't know, something like that. Um, but to actually know that you haven't, that, that you can do it, that you can actually construct it, that's hard. Um, yeah, so if you can hit an algebraically closed field, this, and if the characteristic of the field is not zero, then even if you don't contain an algebraically closed field, three to the 12 minus one will work. But for a general field of characteristic zero, even though there exists a bound, I have no idea what the upper bound might be. I, I don't think anybody knows what the upper bound is, what any upper bound is explicitly. You know, even like, you know, using up arrows or whatever. <laughs> Nobody knows, right? Okay. Okay. I mean, I, I would assume that the answer is like, um, like three or four. <laughs> Probably it's three. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, but... You know, like what? It's it's a really horrible situation. Okay, so um, yeah. Well, so what we can do is we can construct examples where you need three, 
And that's hard because kind of very naively, two looks like it should work. I mean, so, so Karpenko's argument, I mean, really it goes, <laughs> it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's a really crazy, interesting argument. It goes, I mean, so you want to say that like, why is two not enough, right? So that the argument is, you say, well, if two was enough, then I, had t then I have two algebras, um, A and B, and the tensor product would be the algebra that I'm looking at C. These are, so like, these are kind of degree three, degree three, degree nine, if, if, if two was enough. And it turns out that, that this, that if you look at these uh, varieties that I mentioned, this, this thing sits in GR39, but that's not really how to think of it. At the algebraic closure, this thing actually looks like um, P2 when you go to an algebraically closed field. So it's like a twisted form of P2. And if you have this equation, then kind of uh, uh, Karpenko observes, I think he attributes the kind of inspiration to, to Mercuriev to, to kind of examine this. But you have a, na a natural like map that mimics the Segre embedding. Um, and, um, and so this is like an embedding, you know, P2, P2 inside of P, what, eight or something, right? And so what you, what you can say, what you, the, the strategy is this. You say, well, if there was a way of breaking this thing up, then I would have a subvariety that looked like a Segre embedded P2 cross P2 inside of my thing here. And then um, Karpenko goes ahead and computes enough of the Chow group information here to show that in some examples there is no such cycle. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of subtle already. And that's just to show that two doesn't work. Okay? Now once you go to three, there's no such Chow obstruction. So for all we, there's, the cycle is there, but does that cycle come from something that looks like that? Who knows? And so we're kind of already out of luck showing that three isn't enough. Um, and yeah, <laughs> so, is that a, a fair summary, <laughs> I guess? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do now. Um, I'm going to, uh, let me try to like change gears and be a little bit more linear so that I can actually get, I mean, I, I don't think it'll work, but I'm gonna try to be a little bit more linear. And what I'm gonna do now is I wanna just go over and like define what are some of these like, what are some of the ways in which you measure kind of like, what are some of the kind of questions about these invariants and kind of field measurements and you know, all of that. So I'm gonna, let me just give a bunch of uh, definitions for, for a bit. Um, and we're gonna try to understand a little bit of how these things interrelate. And I wanna frame at least what some of these problems are. So we've really kind of described a little bit of one of them already. So field invariance. So uh, the first definition is in quotes because nobody really knows what it is. Um, so the dimension of a field, F, is, um, well, okay. So let me just start by saying that there is this thing that we feel like, I, I don't know, that I feel like there should be some like notion of a dimension of a field, but I don't think, I don't think there is a good definition of it. But what, what, what should it be? Um, so this is kind of like we know it when we see it, okay? So uh, the dimension of an algebraically closed field should be zero, because they're like points. The dimension of a finite field should be one. The dimension of, um, of E should be the same as the dimension of F, if E over F is finite. The dimension, if you add an indeterminate, should be the dimension of f plus 1. And just because it feels right, the dimension of the rational number should be 2. OK? And there should be, there's a bunch of other fields that we feel like we know what their dimension should be. OK, but I, I just want to open by saying, like, 
that a lot of kind of conjectures and expectations are implicitly based on the notion of the dimension of a field, which isn't an actual thing. Okay, but, but this really governs our predictions. Okay, what are, some, what are some actual dimensions, though, that are close to this notion? So, um, well, on the one hand, there's the cohomological dimension. So this is the, um, so we say that the cohomological dimension is less than n. Maybe it's easier to say it like that. If um, Hm, uh, let's say Em, well, I guess I could say like Fm if I'm doing it like this, uh, is equal to zero um, whenever M is at least, uh, whenever M is bigger than N, and M is a discrete uh, torsion um, Galois module. And you know, so the cohomological dimension itself is the smallest number such that it's less than that or equal to that number. Uh, now, uh, we might also kind of amend this a little bit uh, by saying the virtual cohomological dimension of a field is the cohomological dimension of the field if you join the square root of minus one. The thing is, like having with if you don't have a if you have real orderings. Um, then you tend to have like infinite cohomological dimension because you have like, well, well because you do. <laughs> okay. um, and so that kind of doesn't necessarily reflect um, all the phenomena that we're interested in often, so we define this virtual cohomological dimension. So, you know, Q, for example, has infinite cohomological dimension, but virtual cohomological dimension too. Um, you can also define the P cohomological dimension by just restricting to M, um, you know, P torsion or P power torsion, for example. Okay. Should I just like flip this board all the way around? Mm, that doesn't really help either. Okay. Oh, the, oh. Okay. Okay. Okay, so there's the cohomological dimension. There's also, um, so we say that, um, we say that F um, has the CN property um, if uh, whenever um, F, uh, little f, <laughs> so homogeneous. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this. Yeah. Okay, good. Is a homogeneous polynomial in, um, uh, let's say, of degree D in, um, um, in more than uh, D to the n variables, then F has a non trivial zero. So, you know, of, of course, the point is, like, as we were, you know, starting out by just looking at hypersurfaces of various size, the naive question is, like, you know, what can you say if you know that you can solve homogeneous equations of some given degree with some number of variables? Like, how much does that tell you? So, uh, so the Diophantine dimension is the, um, is the um, minimum n. Um, such that F has the CN property. Okay. So um, already, um, one can ask the question of like how the Diophantine and cohomological dimensions um, relate to each other. So um, well, there, are, you know, famously there are examples of. Um, of, um, of fields that are C1, um, uh, that, sorry, that are cohomological dimension one, but are not CN for any N. So kind of infinite Diophantine dimension, but actually cohomological dimension one. 
but the converse is still, is still open. So there's a question of Sarah, which is, um, does um, CN, uh, let's, say, do, do, let's say, is the cohomological dimension always bounded by the Diophantine dimension? Um, Sarah observed that this is true um, because of the Milner conjecture for two. Um, but, you know, it's open in general. Um, exactly. The two cohomological dimension is bounded above by the Diophantine dimension. Right. So, um, so I, you know, so this is still this is still open. Um, uh, maybe about eight years ago, um, Ellie Matsuri and I were able to do something for 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 the p cohomological dimension. So it's not like that it's less than di the Diophantine dimension, but it like grows linearly, or it works linearly, where the um, where the coefficient in front is the log base two of p minus one or something. which is like, I don't know. I mean, it's something, I guess. But like, it should just be like, you know, it should just be less than Diophantine dimension itself. It shouldn't vary with P. Okay. Um, So um, another uh, result that kind of ties together some of these things is this kind of fabulous result of, um, of Matsuri's um, from 2016, I guess. So what he showed is that um, if, the, um, if the Diophantine dimension is at most m, in other words, if, if you're of the CM property, and if you have a, a Brouwer class or a, cl a cohomology class, let's say, um, in mu, let's see, what did I, I should say, here I used um, p instead of l, so I'm not going to mess with my notes too much, and I'll, I'll do that. So this is, in other words, an element in the Brouwer group, um, which is p to the t torsion. So you kind of reduce these questions to prime power in any case, but p to the t torsion. Um, and if the uh, index um, divides um, p to the s, so, so here, so the, the period divides the index. So here, like t, we're going to assume is like less than or equal to s. So the question is, like, how many symbols do you need to write alpha? Um, and so what he shows is that you need, at most, uh, what did he have? Uh, t times p to the um, m minus 1 um, minus 1 symbols to write um, alpha. So for a long time, it had been absolutely unknown like how to get any kind of upper bound, or even if there was an upper bound that depended only on like something like the Diophantine dimension. Um, so, right. So this tells you that this kind of question about like uh, how many, yeah, so how many, the, how, how many symbols do you need to express a Brouwer class? That comes from the Diophantine dimension. And then I guess there's, it's maybe worth mentioning, um, let's, wait, um, right. So let me, let, me, let me say it like, let me, let me make a little diagram here. So there's Diophantine dimension, there's cohomological dimension, there's um, symbol length, and so Diophantine dimension gives a bound on symbol length. Um, 
Diophantine dimension gives some sort of bound on cohomological dimension, although it's not the bound that we want. It's something. You can't go backwards. Um, what about uh, symbol length in cohomological dimension? So it turns out there, um, there's a, a nice kind of elementary argument. Um, so, uh, so basically, this was kind of observed uh, in some cases by Bruno Kahn, but uh, kind of I somewhat plagiarized and, and just noticed that his argument worked for in general. But uh, so symbol length actually gives a bound on cohomological dimension. So this is kind of interesting, even for the Brouwer group, just for the Brouwer group. So if you have, um, you know, so in general you have some, you know, it, it amounts to something like this. You have some, some symbol, like, I don't know, call it like, let's pretend it's like some even dimension, some symbol in here. And you want to, um, you want to show that if m is really big, then this thing has to be zero. Well, uh, the deal is you take this thing and you write it as like, you know, uh, you kind of split it up as like, you know, A1, A2, et cetera. And you imagine the class A1, A2, plus A3, A4, plus dot, dot, dot. And now this is a class in H2 in the Brouwer group. And it turns out that there are these, you know, just like in topology, there are these like exterior power operations where you can take this thing and take its mth exterior power and get this thing. But what you find um, is that if the symbol length in H2 is small, so that this thing could have been written as a shorter thing, then that exterior power is actually going to vanish. So that gives you the bound. I mean, it's like, I'm sure there's like a better bound. OK, uh, so but I mean, the, the, the plot, all I'm trying to do is communicate like that there are what these kind of invariants are, what these kind of measurements are that people are interested in, and a little bit about some of the connections between them. Um, so there's, a, there's kind of another, I don't know, factor here. Um, which I'll kind of write here as essential dimension in, in quotes. But really, what I really mean here is the, the question of how hard is it to write down algebraic objects? How many parameters do you need? How hard is it to express them? And, you know, we've kind of been doing this by example as we've been going along. How hard is it to write things down in various, in various ways? And so I just want to illustrate that this like where this crazy bound of 3 to the 11th minus 1 actually comes from. I mean, it's, you know, it's not great because it's like the right bound. It's like the wrong bound. But it's, it's interesting that you can do it at all. So how do you get any kind of toe hold on it? So the, let, me, let me give you just like the, uh, okay. Since we're coming towards the end of my talk, I just have to make sure that I end on like some sort of like happy note or something. Um, yeah, th this is happy enough. Okay. Okay. So um, yeah. So I just want to say just at, at the at the end here, how do we come up with this bound if we're given, let's say, somebody gives us an algebra of degree nine and period three? How do you know that you can write this algebra as similar to a tensor product of 3 to the 11 minus 1, like algebras of degree 3, uh, symbols? So these are like, you know, AI, BIs, or whatever. How, how, do you, how do you see that you can do that? So the, the proof goes something like this. So again, so now the interesting thing here is like, this stuff is all about arithmetic of particular fields, kind of. But this thing has nothing to do with a particular field. But still, we're going to use this technology to do this. right? So it goes something like this. Uh, and now I'm going to, so, uh, so let me assume, that's going to be very similar if you're a finite characteristic, but assume, let's say, um, you have an algebraically closed field inside. 
Um, now, what you do is you, you have this algebra A is a priori defined over F, but the, um, but the kind of theory of essential dimension, uh, in particular this uh, result of um, uh, bacon mercuriev back from 2012, um, tells us really how many parameters we actually need to write down A. So kind of if, if you write down like the, to, write, to say that you've written down A, maybe it's multiplication table or something like that, you don't need to use every possible element in F. You need some finite list of elements. How many do you need? Um, so in particular, uh, they, they show that you can do it. Um, so if, um, well, in general, I guess if you have, I'll do this, if you have um, P to the S period P to the T, because I'll get confused otherwise if I use actual numbers. But they're 9 and 3. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, but, so, but so what they show is that you need, um, that you're defined over a, over a field with transcendence degree at most um, p to the 2s minus 2 plus p to the s minus t. This is how many parameters you need over whatever subfield that you, you pick, some prime field or whatever you want. You need this many parameters. So in other words, you know, you look like you're defined over a field that looks like k bar adjoin x1 through x, you know, n, where n is that. And this algebra comes from something like that. OK, but now um, this field is dimension n in, in any sense, actually. And in particular, excuse me, it turns out that it'll have Diophantine dimension uh, N, capital N here. And so now you can use Matsuri's result. And you know that over, over a field of that dimension, you need at, mis, at most this many symbols. And so where this M is N, and so that gives you the formula, right? So you need at most like T times uh, P to the, well, what's M? M is this to the P to the 2S minus 2 plus P to the S minus T um, minus 1. Anyways, if you look at the um, 3, 9 example, that gives you 3 to the 11 minus 1, I think. Um, yeah, and that's, so this is like at least one way that you, you try to get bounds. Of course, these are horrible giant bounds. But, um, and we, we hope they're not right, <laughs> but because uh, we'd like to believe the world is a better place than that. But may maybe they are, I don't know, right? Um, I mean, but you know, of course, the horrible thing here is that we use the fact that, that this thing was, had Diophantine dimension capital N. If, K, if you didn't have an algebraically closed field, but just a finite field, because you were characteristic P, then you get in pl that plus one, basically. Um, but if you're Q or something like that, Q doesn't have a bounded Diophantine dimension at all. You know, our number of fields don't. So this method breaks, and even though we know that the number is bounded, we, we don't know what it is. Um, okay, so I, let me just say, um, uh, so next time, after, our, um, after the Wednesday break, um, what I, um, what I want to do is kind of focus more on, um, on what we, how we can answer these questions, at least in the context of particular fields that maybe are close to those that arise in nature, um, and, um, you know, kind of explore some of these questions on the last lecture that we looked at here for the Brouwer group for higher cohomology, for which we, we don't quite know nothing. We know a little bit. So, you know, it won't take more than, you know, an hour to tell you everything that I know. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's it. <laughs>